Good evening. Here's what's happening. We're interrupting our special broadcasting to bring you this special report. Yesterday afternoon, five Americans were shot down by other Americans on the airstrip at Port Kaituma, Guyana. One of the dead, Representative Leo Ryan of California. They'd gone to investigate a cult called the People's Temple, headed by a man known as the Reverend Jim Jones, and they were killed by members of that cult. Appalling as that was, it did not prepare us for what was to follow. What you're about to see almost defies description, and some of you may not want to watch it. Nine hundred ten died in the poison ritual of the People's Temple. The word on everybody's lips was shades of Auschwitz. They found tremendous quantities of potassium cyanide poison mixed with Kool-Aid. The bodies seemed awful and orderly, not flung about like corpses after a battle, but neat, hand in hand sometimes, arms about each other's shoulders. Jones' victims were our brothers and sisters. What was it that caused them to leave their Christian churches and join Jones? Why in the world did so many people agree to kill themselves? You have never met a man like Jim Jones before. I am here, the spirit of Christ, to set you free, to deliver you from your captivity. Jim was really captivating. He had this way of really reaching into your emotions. The community that he had developed in People's Temple was what I had been looking for all along. It was full of life. There was a message of equality for all people. You're going all over the country, taking the message of God and carrying it out to the masses. I am creator of the People's Temple Mission, and I will have my way, or I will tear hell out of everything you've built. The more power he got, the darker the story got. What my father was doing was building a little kingdom for himself. Your whole life, it was all based around the church. There was a consequence to any infraction. You punk, you damn gangland punk! We were going to be hunted down and killed if we ever left. There is something seriously wrong here. You cannot stamp me out! I'm here to save! The leader has lost his mind. People are being held here against their will. You bring those kids back here! This dark side. Let's just be done with it. Let's be done with the agony of it. We'll expand and expand. Hurry, my children, hurry. Until finally it explodes in the Guyanese jungle. If we can't live in peace, then let's die in peace. The survivors of the Jonestown suicide murders were met by friends, relatives, and a handful of People's Temple members from San Francisco. Oh, no. One of the biggest mysteries in the Jonestown story is what kind of a leader could order mass suicide and be obeyed? Who was Jim Jones that grown-ups would kill themselves and their children for him? I think there's an opinion that these people that went down there were off they were a little crazy. They, uh, they weren't like us. When all they were were people who wanted a better life and thought that they were going to get it and worked damn hard to get it. Before joining the People's Temple, I was a teenager. Just kind of a little lost soul floating around. I was in an interracial relationship. My first wife was African American. Our relationship was not embraced by family, either hers or mine. Cheryl and I were kind of in the world by ourselves. We had no support system whatsoever and felt very isolated in the world. And we walked into that temple. It was full of life. Yeah. 
everyone was uh, was singing. It was very alive. It was very up, and you know, people dancing in the spirit. We were embraced as an interracial couple, and there was a message of inclusivity. There was a message of equality for all people. People were passionate. People were engaged. They were talking about that there was this injustice in the world and, you know, discrimination. And so that moved me. I ended up in People's Temple because my sister got involved in heavy drugs. And my mother just not knowing where to turn. So a friend of hers told her there's this church that has a drug rehab program for youth. I felt like I was a part of this incredible community that put self aside because there was a greater good. And the greater good was to ensure that babies didn't go to bed hungry, that there was equality for everyone. I liked that. I liked the thought that I could actually make a difference. The first time I went to a People's Temple meeting, as soon as I walked in the door, I felt like I was home. In the summer of 66, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. I was 19 years old and it really messed with my head. When I was discharged from the Marine Corps, I didn't really know what to do with myself. I was searching spiritually. The People's Temple was a perfect kind of synthesis of what I was feeling at the time, spiritually and politically. And I still hadn't even met Jim Jones yet. There is, in fact, somebody to respond anytime there is a need. The man who is, in fact, People's Temple. Let me present to you Reverend Jim Jones. This administration is for no other purpose That's right. than to show mankind right. the road to freedom. Amen. But I'm here as a sample and example to show you that you can bring yourself up with your own bootstraps yeah. and you can become your God. Amen. We shall have our freedom here and now. Jim was really captivating. As a child, I just thought, wow, here's a man who has this speaking ability that is dynamic. Think of Martin Luther King at his best in terms of oratory now, and that's who Jones was. From the lowest of economic positions, from the misery of poverty near the railroad tracks, I came to show you that the only God you need is within yeah. you. He had this way of really reaching your emotions. He would address each kind of grouping within People's Temple to get us engaged. If you wanted him to be a minister, he would talk about the Bible. If you wanted him to be political, he was absolutely going to include that. Edie? Fingers, are your fingers numb? In your right hand. Enormous headaches in your head. Yes. Reach your hands out. Reach your hand out to me. And then there was this other aspect that we had never seen, and that was the healings. Reach the fingers out that are bothering you. Now, is the pain gone? The idea that someone could call someone out of the audience, know about them, and then heal them of some ailment, that was amazing. I've never seen anything like that. During the course of my time at the People's Temple, I witnessed many, many, many healings. Come forth, my dear. Stand up. Take that step. 
Move forward. Move forward. Go, Christian. Go. Go. Even though I'm a skeptic, I had to be convinced because what's real is real that I could see, I could see. He said, in the name of Christ, you're healed, and my pain was gone. And now, a year and a half later, it's still gone, and I praise God for that. I've been waiting all this time since Vietnam to contribute my energies to something that I felt was actually doing good. I jumped in with both feet. The one thing that I never thought, never even dreamed of, is that our biggest enemy was the leader. Now will each of you give a very fond embrace or a salutary kiss of greeting to your neighbor. Let's fill this atmosphere with warmth. It wasn't just Jim Jones standing there. It was really the ambiance that he created around him. His wife, Marceline, sitting on stage, seemingly, you know, mesmerized by what he was saying. And he'd always talked about himself as a family man. Jim had adopted kids of all different races. So, you know, I was pretty sold that he was a good dad and a good leader. When the Joneses decided to adopt, they came up with the concept of the rainbow family. Let's try to vary our family so we will be the living embodiment of how people of all races come together and belong together. As the story goes, my family went in to adopt a baby girl. And I guess from, from what my mother used to tell me, I started crying. My mother went over to pick me up. My father came over and saw his black baby in his wife's arms. They looked at the social worker at the orphanage and said, why can't we adopt this child instead? And they kind of went, no, 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 no. As, a, as an African-American child. And my father took this political stance. No, I will adopt any child that, that, that we want. So I probably should say I never liked the title, The Rainbow Family. We were a mixed bag for sure, especially for that time. Now, in many respects, that's lovely, regardless of the motivation. But what I felt was that much of what was created as a family was done for show. It's hard to know if dad really believed anything or what he believed if he did. My father was starved for attention from a very early age and that never let up. If anything, it intensified. In a little town in Indiana, the moment I think of it, a great deal of pain comes. Jim Jones is born and he's raised in rural Indiana where, back then, one of the main purposes in life is to fit in, to be like everybody else. And from the time Jim Jones is born, that doesn't happen. Part of the problem are his parents. His father was destroyed by World War I. My Grandma Jones, she wasn't around a lot, so my father wasn't being nurtured in a way that I feel a child is best nurtured. And I think he compensated for that. And so he sought the approval of others in a variety of ways. In a small town like Lynn, Jim was a little on the weird side. Jim had this flair for the dramatic and I, th I think he enjoyed being dramatic. 
He would recruit the other kids to come to elaborate funerals he's holding for roadkill. I don't know whether it was just for its own sake or whether it was to freak people out. All the boys in Lynn during World War II started playing war games. And they all wanted to be allied soldiers, except one. Jim Jones was mesmerized by the way Hitler could have a whole audience enraptured, stand up and perform, and order people to do things, and they would do it. He was eccentric, and that could be off-putting to some children. He was very controlling in his nature. He did spend a, a fair amount of time on his own. He was left to his own devices. So where could he find this community? I think with my father, church was where he could find solace, find peace. The other boys want to play baseball, ride their bikes. Jim joins five different churches. And as a child, he saw that in those church services, there was one guy, the guy that was talking, that got all the attention. My father's picking up different components of each religion. But I do think you ought to say it for the glory of God if you're that yeah. much smart. Baptist preacher who would you know, slam the Bible down. And her, hallelujah, hallelujah, the Pentecostal person talking in tongues, you know, skipping up and down the aisle. Jimmy's not just watching the people rolling on the floor. He's paying attention to these preachers. What do they say? How do they get people built up to this point? How does this minister keep an audience enthralled? It was a given. Of course he's going to be a minister. What else is this weird boy going to be? His mother instilled in him this concern for uh, the, the downtrodden, the, the have-nots. And I think that he genuinely felt it was wrong that people be judged by the color of their skin or their background or what they come from. His message resonated more with African-Americans. They were so tired of the Jim Crow laws. I'm going to tell you one thing, darling. You and me are the same. To the white man, we're the same. They don't think any more of us. They don't want any more to do with us. Jones in the black community in Indianapolis becomes a hero. But you can only go so far in Indianapolis. He was not going to be just a small town guy. He wanted to be more universally known. He was not somebody committed to the Word of God or the Bible. He wanted notoriety. He wanted power. Where is the power? That's where I want to go. California, that's the place. That's where you can make things happen. But he had to bring as many of his followers as he could. What's he going to tell them the reason they have to go? We have to be prepared to take our flight in the case of Armageddon that would spring forth in a nuclear hell. Jones he starts prophesizing. There's going to be nuclear war. Everyone living here is going to die. It's his excuse to get the hell out of Indiana. And it works. In terms of a darker side that would ultimately end up being the tragedy at Jonestown, I think that that started actually in California. Regardless of what good works the temple was involved in, what my father was doing was building 
a little kingdom for himself. I am creator of the People's Temple Mission, and I will have my way, or I will tear hell out of everything you've built. We got through River Valley, we had some resources and people moved into the different homes. And Jim had bought this home with this big grape field in front of it. And shortly after, Jim had the resources to build a church. When they relocated to Redwood Valley, a new group of people were attracted to the preaching of Jim Jones. And this was this white educated elite. The membership of People's Temple at that point tripled. My life changed when I moved up to Redwood Valley. It was really kind of nice having been raised in the city. We were very busy with church activities and duties. And when you went to sleep, you kind of felt like you helped people and accomplished something but there was something that wasn't right. I shall do all the miracles that you said your God would do and never did. Yeah. I shall come and heal you all the diseases that you prayed for that never happened. I think Jim was a power addict early on. He was always watchful, trying to think how he could control People's Temple members. When People's Temple has grown big enough, Jones can start teaching the real purpose of People's Temple. The only thing that brings perfect justice, freedom, and equality, perfect love in all of its beauty and holiness is socialism. So socialism. And socialism is wrong. We were being introduced to socialism. Socialism meant that everybody would have the same. There would be no starvation. There would be no one going without any clothes. All the basic needs that a human being is supposed to have, they would have under socialism. He starts encouraging communal living. And let's say in a house that might have been designed for six people to live, he'll put 12, 15, or even 20. And they'll sleep on mattresses on the floor. That was so strange to me, but it felt good to sacrifice because the sacrifice was for the greater good. No one realized that Jim was using socialism to bring people in and control people. This is a church that you're either all the way in or all the way out. There's no in between. And this church expected you to give up everything. He didn't want people having sex, you know, because you were supposed to use your sexual energy for the cause. We were always asked to further our commitment. Are you willing to get up your little petty desires and reach your comforts, or are you just full of hot air? I don't own a car, I don't own any new furniture, I never buy any new clothes, I have never bought a new pair of shoes in my life, and that's why I am free. You're not free, you're a slave! You're doing just exactly what the man wants you to do. Everything went to people simple. All the things that my mother had, antiques, china, and his beautiful home in Ukiah. My mother gave her house up for Jim Jones. The whole idea of going communal is that you start to cut down on the outside influence. Everybody is working as much as possible. Jones said to one of his followers, the key is keep them poor, keep them tired, and they'll never leave. Jones' spiel was that family relationships are the sickest relationships of all. So the families were separated. I cared for four children myself that were not mine. They were someone else's children. Now Jones wants his followers to refer to him and Marceline as father and mother. Marceline loved the idea they were a team. They were working together. He pretended he was a family man, but you know, really that was all a facade. That was all the public persona. Nothing is as it appears. Most people had no idea Jim was not being faithful. He found another long-term companion. 
Her name was Carolyn Leighton. And Carolyn was absolutely enraptured of Jim Jones. The things he was saying and doing mirrored her beliefs. As a young child, I think I first started noticing that when Jim would leave at night and come home in the morning, his not being faithful. It was just wrong. I was mortified, horrified by it. That's where my esteem for him gradually uh, fell apart. Eventually, I remember my mother wanting a divorce. She wanted the kids. And Jim said, you will die before you take my kids away from me. And this dark side that appears really for the first time in Ukiah will expand and expand until finally it explodes in the Guyanese jungle. People's Temple population starts to grow. And as it grows, so does Jones's need for money. Jim was looking for more membership. So in about 1972, we started bus trips around the country. People's Temple buys a fleet of Greyhound buses. Jim Jones is going to go to the big cities, and he is going to attract huge crowds, get a lot of money, and then he'll come back, he can use that in Ukiah. We would pass out leaflets, speak to people, try to get them to the service, and tout the wonders of Jim Jones and People's Temple. As a teenager, what, what better life could you have? You're hanging out with all your friends, you're going all over the country, and taking the message of God and carrying it out to the masses. Along the way, people always joined. A couple buses aren't filled. That's so as people want to join, they can just get on the bus and go with him. And as his following grows, they find peripheral ways to make money. They start selling pictures that Jones has blessed. This picture here would sell for $5. This is another picture that he had uh, for protection. No. And if you don't have money for the pictures, give us your name and address, and Reverend Jones will bless a penny, and you'll be in his prayers. They market all kinds of things. Money comes pouring in. Don't need to worry, I'll throw you out of church. I'll get you on that Greyhound bus if you don't have a penny. And I'll give you the finest room you ever saw. Just get on my bus and I'll take you on to the promised land. Hey, Spirit! God! The man is a master entertainer. Everything is planned to the minute. And then come the healings. Sister Ingram, you're concerned about the losing... losing of your sight. Take your glasses off. You concentrate hard. How many fingers? Three. You've been feeling pain here in the chest? Yeah. Look at my face. Where's your pain? Everybody is out of their minds with excitement. And Jones has never been more dramatic. One time, a person broke their leg. So they were taken to the hospital and put a cast on it. The next service, the name was called and asked if they wanted to walk again. You see him walk on this leg like he's ever The cast was cut off right in front of everybody. Broke 
you're seeing this woman who's all of a sudden running through the church and everyone's just excited and Father's healed her. And then a big thing at the time was removal of cancers. You have a cancer. I can tell. Come forward. I'm going to heal you. This sister, when she was in the church of God and Christ, no one could heal her. Five times operated for cancer. The doctor sold her up to die. But I, I said one day a year ago, your time has come and she spit up the cancer. You're healed. People were jumping and happy and I thought, oh my gosh, she's healed of cancer. I'm excited. The whole church is just in a frenzy. As time wore on, I started questioning the healings. I should have known that it was a lie. And people died because of that. As time wore on, I started questioning the healings. There was a rumor that there was something nefarious going on. The healing with the woman that they cut the cast off and she's running around. They drugged her and they put the cast on her while she was asleep. So when she woke up, they told her that she had fallen. They said, oh, you broke your leg. And she had no recollection of it at all. Her leg was never broken. The fake healings were a way to attract people falsely. Even though they were great tools to get people to believe, they were nefarious. I personally know someone's grandmother, who Jim apparently healed of cancer. And then when cancer came back, guess what she said? It must be because I don't believe enough. She wasn't going to get treatment. She was just going to pray harder and have more faith in Jim. Well, she died of cancer. And that's just one of, I'm sure, hundreds of stories. This is one of those areas where that should have been a red flag that I just ignored. I'm not saying it's right, but I believe the temple was an opportunity to create something that was truly great. And that's why I stayed as long as I did. The temple was set up so no one could join the church without first being checked out thoroughly by Jones. Everything required him to be involved. And the pressure got to him. And Jones became an abuser of drugs. Jim Jones shared with the congregation that he had to take something to keep him up because he worked 24-7 24 hours a day for the cause of socialism. He needed amphetamines to get up and keep going. His schedule would last from early in the morning until 2 or 3 a.m. So he was sleeping maybe three or four hours a night. And then when he could rest, he, he had to take tranquilizers to come down. And I must say it is a great effort to be gone. I wish it upon another, but no one else has the faculty that I do. In the meantime, I shall be God, and yeah. beside me, there shall be no other. Yeah. Yeah. I had no idea that Jim was on drugs. No idea at all. Later, I would discover the sunglasses was because he was hiding the way his eyes looked. Everybody remembers that Jim Jones always wore dark glasses. It was one of his signature appearance things. And he told everyone it was because the Spirit of the Lord was so powerful in him. If you look directly in his eyes, you might be burned on the spot. But the real reason he did was his eyes were so red and watery and swollen from the drug use. As he was taking more and more drugs, you know, his personality changed. Behind the scenes, Jim's narcissism was just uncontained. And he was surrounded by mistresses. The women that Jones was having sex with almost all considered it an honor to do this for father. He portrayed himself as a martyr, that he would have to have sex with these different members to 
solidify their alliance, to solidify their loyalty. He made a lot of really crude remarks. If I need to get you to socialism on the tip of my dick, I'll do it. Each time he had sex with somebody, he did it as one more notch in his belt of how to become yet more powerful. Jones always said, the ends justifies the means, which means you can do anything you need to do to get to where you want to go, because the goal is for the greater good. So no matter how you get there, you get there, which excuses anything, any behaviors at all. To all outward appearances, Jones and People's Temple had accomplished great things and there was unlimited future. But the lust for power continues to grow. He would create enemies to bind his followers closer. The government was out to get us, and it was a conspiracy. Look at all the people that have been killed. Look at all of our young people who are in prison. Actual events were used to uh, solidify his position. And it was extremely effective because there was truth to it. I just come in from Washington, just flew in on the plane from the conference with the top-notch leaders. I listened to them talk about planned takeovers. I listened to them to talk about it like it was just an ordinary Sunday school picnic. Task Force warns nation to get ready for riots and to get ready for martial law. They're going to put all the poor people away and they're going to come for you. They're going to come for your children. There was so much paranoia about the ways that law enforcement was going to break up the community of People's Temple. They looked at themselves as people who were being persecuted from the outside. We ended up going to church more and more. Before you knew it, your whole life, it was all based around the church. Now we're in an isolationist mode, where Jim would tell us that we were, you know, that black people were gonna be put in concentration camps dictatorships that can come in like they did with the Japanese. So oh, this country won't ever do that. It did it already. He's tapping into people's fears. He's tapping into people's insecurities. The paranoia was real in people's simple. Get ready for identification marks to be put on your body and an identification number even necessary tattooed on you. You say, oh, America wouldn't do that. Don't talk to me about what America would not do. We lived through Martin being assassinated. We lived through Malcolm being assassinated. We lived through Robert Kennedy being assassinated. Assassination for leaders was something you thought about. Jim was saying that he was getting death threats because he was making such a difference and stirring up so much controversy in the community of bringing black people and white people together that he was a threat to the status quo. One Sunday service, I was out in the parking lot talking to someone. We're all out after church, and we're having festivities. The kids are playing the basketball court. We got tables out for the meal in between church. Bright, sunny, beautiful day. We were enjoying ourselves. And then all hell broke loose.
people were screaming, father shot. There's blood flowing from his chest. Father's been shot and screams and a lot of anguish, people crying out. There's someone trying to assassinate Jim Jones. Then they rushed everybody into the temple. We're scared because we don't know if someone else is out there shooting. Was it one shooter? Was it more than one shooter? And so we're in the temple and people are just in a panic that we might lose father. A mourn quiet comes over the whole community. I was really afraid. The idea of outside threat, the idea of them and us, if you weren't with us, you were against us, that was the message we heard constantly. The doors opened, and one of Jim's security was carrying the shirt with blood. There's red stains on it. And there's two holes that you can put a finger through. And Jim's behind him, but there's not a mark on him. He's healed himself. You can put me into the noose, you can hang my body, but I'll spring up again. You cannot stamp me out. I'm here to stay. People are in a frenzy. I mean, crying, joyful, ecstatic. It was, the energy was just, it was just electric. And we're thinking, oh my God, Father healed himself. Yeah. You've never seen anyone shot down as I was before your eyes with the blood spurting from the body and healed themselves, yet I, the socialist worker, did that. How many believe that I am the Savior? The only Savior. They were convinced that this man is God. It brought people together. He was going to be the force, the person who was going to lead us to the promised land. It wasn't until later that I knew that that was fake. Later on, I learned from my mother how that had gone down and that blanks were fired uh, to fake this, this attack. I don't know how it was faked, but my father was always looking for ways to create drama so that he could be the savior and the champion within all that drama. Everything he did was a test to see how many people were gonna stay and how many people were gonna leave. So every moment he's pushing the envelope a little bit, you know, a little bit further, right? People were true believers. And you wanted to be, because you were going to change the world. I believed in him 100%, and I believed in who he said he was. I would follow Jim Jones anywhere, and I did. When we moved to San Francisco, things went to the next level. People's Temple is getting more people, they're getting more money, the fame is spreading. But you can only go so far in Redwood Valley. In San Francisco, we have more political strength, and that's important. You got the backing of some people. We build outside of the city, we don't have that backing. In San Francisco, he is going to gradually insinuate himself until he becomes a power broker. I first heard of People's Temple when I was a part-time writer for the Chronicle back in the uh, early 70s. They would turn out big crowds at rallies. The city was full of groups that had shown they weren't happy with conventional life. Jones very much played into that. He was a new guy with a new message, with a new act. This country will not be safe until we do something to share the wealth and share it completely and fairly and democratically and peacefully. 
he donated money, he participated in causes. He cultivated friends in a very clever way. He rose fast as a political power. Jim Jones was known as a person, if you had a political activism going on, call Jim Jones, get him involved. And Jim Jones had to see how he could manipulate it for himself. Reverend Jones, how do you account for such an avid following as you seem to have? I'm principled and dedicated to my people. He loved the attention. You know, he loved to be mingling with the creme de la creme, the politicians in San Francisco. He was thriving in that. Let me say first of all that I'm very grateful for this tremendous crowd. Rosalind Carter was in the city to campaign for her husband. And where she was at, there weren't that many people that showed up. And so somebody called up Jones and said, can you get some people here? And so we filled up three buses and drove everybody down there. And all of a sudden there was a big crowd. And on the news, it was, look at the warm reception that Rosalind Carter is receiving here in San Francisco. And Rosalind Carter met with him privately to talk about his political involvement in Jimmy Carter's election. So much to where he got invited to the inauguration. The legend of Jim Jones and People's Temple is out there. And money comes pouring in. Very much interested in this. He's becoming more and more popular. The newspapers cover him like a celebrity. In San Francisco, you got Willie Mays, you got the jazz scene, and now all of a sudden you've got Jim Jones. My father was always grandiose, as far back as I can remember, and that grandiosity only grew as the temple grew. He was always managing his image of himself because he was always at war with that voice inside of him, I believe, that was telling him he wasn't enough. He was a fraud. And I think that's where drugs really came in much more heavily. Jim Jones had always been mistrustful of most people, but the rampant drug use increased his paranoia. As the temple grew, Jones felt like he's losing touch with rank and file members. He feels as though some of his people may betray him. So he creates the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission was made up of the leadership of People's Temple and they were the ones who were closest to Jim Jones personally. They were the ones that were making decisions about the day-to-day -day operations of People's Temple. At their meetings, it gives Jones a chance to sit there and listen to what people are talking about and get some sense of the way his people are feeling. I was on the Planning Commission for five years. During a Planning Commission meeting, I'd pass around a paper and people who had information about how somebody was doing would write down notes. I'd type it up and then give it to Jim and the secretaries. It became more of a spying on you thing. The Planning Commission at the People's Temple, as far as I was concerned, was an enforcement agency. If you got called to the Planning Commission, you were in some serious, serious trouble. There was a consequence to any infraction, whether it be you fell asleep during a meeting, someone reported that you were having an affair with someone else. I was called to the Planning Commission. I had just gotten my ears pierced. Jim Jones said, well, what did you do that for? Well, bourgeois is that. And I, I made some remark, and they all just jumped me. All these people had started pounding me and stuff. And I think they ripped the earrings out. I was not considered by Jim Jones as one of the faithful. I got in trouble a lot. Why is it just whether you do this? I save you from worse than death. That, that I was just um, pissed at the time. I don't think you will change where you're going. 
I mean, I know you're gonna kick my ass, but really, John, uh, get out of the way. Let the seniors have it. <laughs> yes. You punk, you goddamn gangland punk. You cause us trouble week after week, month after month. Got my blood pressure rolling, punk, motherfucker. <sighs> it's so sickening, I can't hardly talk about it. And then it gets to the boxing matches. You're gonna have an opponent that would beat on someone that was not even a physical match to them. It would get bloody. They're not supposed to even fight back. You're just supposed to get beat. And Jim, he would laugh over this type of thing, this, that sinister laugh he had. <laughs> you fucking bitch, you don't mess me, I'll kill you. <laughs> Jim Jones had a sadistic quality. He absolutely did. He enjoyed that type of thing. It was like a gladiator sport to him, I think. They set up the counseling department, and eventually I got made head counselor. And I'll never forget one night in a meeting, I saw somebody very severely beaten, and I saw them the next day professing their love for Jim Jones as they were walking in the church. And I looked at them, and I said to myself, I don't ever want to be broken and in this situation as a broken person. I'd rather be dead than to live the rest of my life in this situation. I knew I had to leave. From the time he organized his first storefront church in Indianapolis, Jones took it personally any time anybody left. He couldn't stand it. Because loyalty was the greatest value within people's temple, defection was the greatest sin. There was always the fear that anybody that left would be utilized by the enemies to help tear down people's temple. Some people wanted to desert our ship. They thought we were going to sink. You that stayed with us, you were repaid. You were repaid for your loyalty. You that stood with your father, you have been the good children. He preaches that once you're in with us, you're part of us forever. He has members sign statements claiming that they have done all sorts of terrible things from committing cold-blooded murder to planning the assassination of the President of the United States. I signed blank pieces of paper. I signed pieces of paper that I wanted to kill the President. I signed pieces of paper that I molested my child. Try being in a room with 50 people, and you're asked to sign a blank piece of paper and say, no, I'm not going to sign it. If you didn't sign it, they're like, oh, are you thinking about leaving? Should we be concerned about you? He's got something on everyone, all of it manufactured, but making it clear, if you leave this church, we'll make it hard on you. I was done, spent. Grace Stone was People's Temple royalty. She had a child while in the church. Jones claimed the child as his. She knew a lot about church activities. She was very informed on how the church operated. But then the personal stuff, the beatings, were just too heavy a memory and experience for her to ignore. I'll never forget we were on a cross-country trip, and one of the members came to me and he said, Grace, please stop acting out, stop acting up. He said, they're talking about you, they're gonna get you when we get back, and they're gonna beat you up. And I said to myself, I'll never allow myself to get beaten. I knew I had to leave. And um, I just gathered some stuff. I didn't tell anyone I was leaving. I snuck out. and I ended up escaping with one of the bus drivers. We were told to leave the state because we were gonna be hunted down and killed if we ever left. She left the temple, but leaving her son behind, she knew that she couldn't probably pry him loose and get away like that. It was hard. It was, it was very hard, very devastating for me. 
and we left on July 3rd. And I'll never forget, we woke up to what we thought were gunshots. We sat up and we went, oh my God, they've already found us. Only to realize it was firecrackers. It was 4th of July. Life oh. has no meaning other than principle. And I could not let this child go with that criminal, Mrs. Gray Stone. It seems that some people have lost their way. Tragically lost their way. What kind of morality would cause her to do this to father? Every time someone would leave, Jones would absolutely lose it. Jones was so paranoid about the loyalty of his people, he decided he would give the Planning Commission members the ultimate test. We're having a Planning Commission meeting in San Francisco. The meeting starts, and the ranch had a small vineyard that was part of the property that was there. So on this night, he said, we have some wine from the ranch. Everybody's invited to have some. There were styrofoam cups, like half filled with wine. Drank the wine. And like five minutes later, Jones says, you've all just been poisoned. So immediately inside, my adrenaline starts running. People were yelling and screaming. Jones says, you have an hour to live. Jones says, no one leaves. And the minutes go by. People start saying, I can feel myself dying. I'm feeling faint. So after about 45 minutes, Jones says, okay, well, you haven't all been poisoned. This was a test to see how you handle death. So I thought, okay, he's teaching people what it's like to face your own mortality, your own death. That's how I rationalized that. I want to make it clear that was a rationalization on my part. Not one of them grabbed Jones by the throat, you know, you son of a bitch. There was none of that reaction. He had people that much cowed, that much under his control. He really enjoyed seeing what people did. And it was a test of loyalty, right? Are these people really willing to just lay down now that I told them I've killed them? He was very sadistic at that point. Looking back on it, I think the appropriate response would have been, this is a crazy MF and it's time for me to get out of Dodge. It's clear that as early as 1974 that Jim Jones realizes that some of the practices of People's Temple cannot be sustained. The punitive practices with people, Goddamn punk. the paranoid practices, all these things eventually mean that law enforcement is going to come in and break up People's Temple. He needed place that they could escape to in case criticism became too great and in case Jim Jones himself was in danger of being arrested. He loves Guyana because it's socialist. It's mostly minority because it's the only country in South America where the national language is English. He ultimately works out a deal with the Guyanese government and sends a crew out to start building Jonestown. So it started in 74. I think there were like seven guys that went down there. All of them had some heavy equipment experience. We cleared a lot of land and we built a lot of structures in very short time. It was hard, hard work. The clump of trees in the center of the clearing is a five-acre pig pasture. They are trying to build a village that would be able to hold about 500 people, to live there, to work there, to feed them from the crops and so forth. I would like to say at this time that all of this was made possible 
by our leader, Father Jones. This is the hottest part of the uh, entire year, and uh, they're doing real well. When I first heard about Jonestown was 1974. Jim Jones had just come back from Guyana and was giving a talk about Jonestown, and it's going to be an agricultural community. Back over here is the area that we're clearing for more planting. Potatoes and carrots and edos and uh, papaya. We could grow our own food and there would be a community and there wouldn't be any violence or racism. And it was going to be the promised land. Darren, how do you like it here in the promised land? My name is better than Ukiah. My name is Anthony Simon. I'm here in the promised land. My name is Don Swanee, and uh, I'm grateful to be down here. I'm working on a fishing trawler, and I enjoy going down the rivers, meeting new people. It's more freer down here, and it's more beautiful. <laughs> this is a walking stick, friends. But that's a gentle guy. Walking stick. <laughs> Jim Jones said to be able to go to Jonestown was a privilege. It was a reward to go there. The time that I spent there building the town that our community was going to come live in was one of the happiest times in my life up to that point. We are going to have peace in our promised land valley. Now, in retrospect, I know much of what he said at that time was just a flat out lie. You were chosen to bring deliverance to this continent. You are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. I was a city hall reporter here in San Francisco. Notice Jones at a lot of events where he would bring in huge numbers of people for inconsequential meetings. So that piqued my curiosity. Why does he behave this way? Isn't it unusual for a religious figure to travel in this kind of exalted way? I thought there was more to Jim Jones. So I went to a local California magazine at the time called New West, and they said, um, okay, let's see what you got. I had heard Marshall Kilduff had been looking for me and Jeannie and Al Mills, who had defected before I did, called me one night and they said, oh, we're going to do an article. And I said that I would too, that I wasn't going to let them do it alone, that I would speak as well. The ex-members, the folks who had fled the church, said, here's what you don't know. And I think we were there till like 3 o'clock in the morning. I told him everything. The more power that he got, the sicker he got. The whippings got worse and worse. Our daughter was beaten 75 times with a board. I ran with my child out, got into my car, and he was yelling my name as I left. He told me that there would be an accident in which all three of us would be killed. Once you enter people's temple, you don't leave, or you don't leave very easily. There were death threats. There was a lot of pressure from the congregation. We talked it over with our children, explained to them that we were going to be quitting the church, and they said, well, Mom and Dad, we love you very much, and we just hope that when you do decide to quit the church, you move far away so we aren't the ones assigned to kill you. I don't think I really realized how dangerous a position that I was in but I discredit it to being young and not knowing any differently or any better. I think what we had to say need to be heard because in the past, Jim had always been able to stifle any bad press like that. So they were just blown away by what we had to say. We were beaten, we had to give up all our money. There's a sexual angle here that we don't think you know about. Fake healings. The church's inner dynamics. The whole thing. I had no idea. 
This was a new level of problem, a new level of a story. I talked to his aides, I talked to everybody I could at the church. So Jones knew I was working on stories, but he never wanted to talk. Jim advised us defectors were talking to New West Magazine, and there was going to be an article full of lies about People's Temple. We knew it was trouble. We knew that people were talking about what was happening behind closed doors, which we were not supposed to speak about. The lies are so incredible that anybody with the right mind would not believe them. The best thing to do with newspapers is to wipe your ass with them. Jones knew maybe his followers initially are going to believe in him. The father says none of it's true, it's fake news. But his political base, the mayor of San Francisco, the governor of California, He's going to lose that political clout. And when he loses that, he's going to lose his standing in San Francisco. He's going to look terrible. Jim was like hyper. And he increased the talk about enemies and defectors and traitors and people out to get us. When the story breaks, it's tremendously controversial. Everybody reads it, everybody's talking about it. Both San Francisco newspapers immediately assign their own reporters now. Dig in, do more, find more. Reverend Jim Jones works in some very unexpected ways. Why didn't you just get out? Where did all that money go? He had us sign papers, blank papers. No matter what goes on here, you go out and tell everybody everything's okay. Deny everything you hear about what's going on here. The TV stations are all there, flocking. Where's Jim Jones? By the time the story came out and there was this doubt about him, he wasn't around to answer for it. In the New West article, some of the questions had to have direct answers. He didn't want to answer the questions. The shitstorm is not going to stop. So the only solution is to get out. I remember my father saying, we're going to Guyana. I think that Jim Jones was afraid to face the publicity and answer the questions uh, here in this country. After the New West article backlash had happened, groundswell started. What's the story behind Jim Jones? Was all the magic that People Simple put out, was it true? And if you scratch the surface a little bit, you saw maybe it, it wasn't in Guyana. Jim Jones was outraged by the New West article, and he was also very frightened. He was afraid that this would give the detractors of People's Temple the ability to break up the church. The original plan was that as soon as all this died down, he'd be back, but it's not dying down. What he's got to do is he's now got to make Jonestown the focal point of People's Temple. And now suddenly Jim Jones wants virtually everybody in People's Temple to get over there. I wasn't given a reason why I was going to Jonestown. Things were in such a frenzy, it was just, let's get people down there now. That summer, they began shipping people out. Buses went down to banks where people would deposit their money into church accounts. They lined them up with passports to get them out of the country legally. My wife, Gloria, was already in Guyana. And I wanted to be with her for the birth of my child. It wasn't going to happen. I was sent to New York City to help facilitate people getting to Guyana. The media attention on the temple at that time was intense. So they would fly out of different airports, whether it was Los Angeles, Sacramento, San Francisco, and they would fly on different airlines, and they would fly in groups of three. They always sat apart from each other. Nobody recognized anybody else. And there was a flight every day at 4.30. It's important to understand how isolated Jonestown was 
from Georgetown, the capital of Guyana. You've got 160 miles that cannot be driven. You have to either try to fly over the top of the jungle and land on a tiny airstrip, or you have to take a boat along the coast and down a river. It was a 19-hour boat trip from Georgetown up a river, way, 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 way up the river. I was seasick. It was not a pleasant trip, but part of me was happy. It's like, don't complain because you're on the way to the promised land. When we pulled up to the dock and we got off, I was still apprehensive. And we got on the tractor and we rounded this corner and I could just hear that. Welcome, welcome all of you. Jonestown was a town, it was a community. From the doctor's office to the pharmacy. Medications here, one whole shelf that goes half the warehouse length. We have medical manuals, even how we could do surgery if we had to, if the civilizations we know it now began to crumble. To the classrooms, to the kitchen. Different containers around the place. We couldn't go through all the tremendous inventory. They built up Kool-Aid. That was built. From, square, from nothing, from nothing. It was really kind of remarkable that this whole little town was built in the middle of the jungle, far, far away from anything. I wanted to get back to my husband. I was happy to see my baby, my son, and spend time with him. When I finally got into Jonestown, I got to see Gloria and my son and Malcolm. I could actually feel tension leaving my body. Really, it was a physical sensation because it is incredibly beautiful and peaceful. But I thought it was exciting. We've been building this community. As I look out over it, it's the most fantastic thing. And we have made this part of the country. We've enriched it by everything that's growing and all these beautiful buildings and our medical clinic and our lovely home. A typical day in Jonestown was up at five o'clock. There would be someone on the side of the, the cabin with the stick, five o'clock, five o'clock, so five o'clock. We worked six days a week and I was okay with that because I felt like I was building something. And now I was really a good socialist. Getting up and sweaty and this kind of stuff, I hated that. Oh, I hated that. I hated that. I hated walking out of your cabin on a, on in the rainy season and your feet are full of mud and you know I hated all that kind of stuff. But you know something, when you're with 900 people you care about, it didn't seem that bad. I remember the dances, the youth dances. I remember some of the meetings that my father did. And we talked about building a new world, you know? Those are powerful to me. I felt like we were Che Guevara building a new world. That's how I felt. So the people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. Things were good for a while. Grandma Bates, how do you like it here? I love it. I love it. It's, I love it better than any place I've been in my life. All of a sudden, things started shifting. I just love it. I hope we, everything is going to be all right for us.
Jonestown was ill-equipped to provide a life for all the people that arrived. And Jim Jones is aware that what's happening in Jonestown is not sustainable either. Ultimately, Jones has about a thousand people in a place built for half that. Almost instantly, there's not enough food. We're gonna conserve on food, keep that up because we'll need every dollar because this is the only kind of place to be, freedom. As more people began coming, even the children weren't getting what they needed and the senior citizens definitely were not getting the food that they needed. We even sell bananas now because we're trying to make money. We need money so badly to take care of all of our family, to save them. Jones knows he's got money that could take care of that for decades, but he's not revealing that. So instead, people are told we've got to do better or we're going to starve and be humiliated. Now, I know it's not pleasant, children. But my God, somebody's got to fight this revolution. You're physically adjusting to the work, but you get used to it. You get used to the work. What you don't get used to is the sirens in the middle of the night. Or Jim's drugged, sometimes incoherent voice over a loudspeaker in the middle of the night. Attention, attention. There's still not enough energy shown by workers. Around the cottages, in my review, they're not clean. In Jonestown, there were loudspeakers everywhere. They went on 24-7 the voice of Jim Jones. This is essential, absolutely essential. Jim Jones did a terrible job of maintaining his leadership within the community of Jonestown. He would stumble, he would urinate off the side of the walkways. It was apparent that his drug use had increased. He was slurring his speech. We must stop the dilatoriness, dilatoriness, dilatory way in which some people regard their own property. Remember, his number one source of well-being, if you could even call that, was adulation or feeling like he was adored by the people around him. And now his source was finite. It was the same people every day, same thing. So what he tried to do was just escalate things. You people all tighten me up. God damn you, sons of bitches. God damn you. Because you sons of bitches, anything I do, you got to do. God damn you. Why don't you work like I do then? Why don't you take the burdens I do then? So I'm looking at all this. I'm seeing this. And I'm starting to really acknowledge what I'm seeing as not my imagination or not my ability to be a good socialist, but the fact that there is something seriously wrong here. I think Dad was very much aware of the fact that our town could not last. What we were doing was not sustainable. As Jim Jones realized what was happening at Jonestown was a kind of failed experiment, he and his leadership began to ask themselves, how can we still succeed in terms of history? And so this we're an egalitarian community that's going to show the world how we can live as a utopian gathering of people became instead, how do we show the world what a truly committed group of people would do if they are threatened with the disintegration of their community? The people that went to Jonestown wanted to believe in something. I'm no longer a man. I'm a revolution. I am the mighty wind of revolutionary change. And they wanted to make a better world. I never saw us dying from within. I never ever saw it coming. Now will each of you give a salutary kiss of greeting to your neighbor? The first time I went to a People's Temple meeting, I felt like I was home.
When Jim Jones was up on stage, the whole audience was hanging on every word he said. But the more power he got, the darker the story got. Jim is a power addict, always trying to think how he could control people's simple members. Herbert Jones, how do you account for such an avid following? I'm principled and dedicated to my people. When we moved to San Francisco, things went to the next level. But the rampant drug use increased his paranoia. You punk, you goddamn gangland punk! The more power he got, the sicker he got. When the story came out, he wasn't around to answer for it. I remember my father saying, we're going to Guyana. In Jonestown, things were good for a while, but then things started shifting. Our town could not last. I know it's not pleasant, children. My God, somebody's got to fight this revolution. Attention, attention. Every member of the community must come to the pavilion immediately. We may have invasion. Jim said, they're coming for our children. They're coming for our children, and so we need to stand strong. We were all lined up with shovels and pickaxes and whatever other tools were there. We were going to fight. We'll kill them if they come! You don't know what you're missing down here? These are potato chips made from plantain, and they're more delicious. They're a combination of a potato chip and a french fry. And radishes, mm-mm-mm. Here are the people at the table eating an afternoon snack. Well, it's another sunny day. It's interesting, when I walk out, every time I walk out, as the people can verify, the rain will stop. So that's been amazing. I think there are many different reasons people went to Jonestown. It had a lot to do with peer pressure. For many of them, they were probably hopeful. You know, we can be a happy community again. You all happy? You here? You happy, Tom? Yes. Everybody's happy down here. You can see that that's an obvious fact. The story was we were going to paradise. The grand utopia. But we're trying to feed over 900 people down there. It was a battle we wouldn't win. And probably Dad saw that. So the drama just escalated, which only weakened all of us and frightened all of us and, frankly, drew us more into his own sickness. As time grew on, the difference in Jim Jones was very marked. I think Dad was feeling lost in Jonestown. He could no longer parade about and convince himself of how grand he is. His drug use, just at that point, was off the charts. He's passed out half the time in his cabin. He blows up physically. He's terribly bloated. So instead of seeing, you know, their godlike leader, it's just a fat, sweaty man. He loses any claim to divinity because they're too close to him now. There's no place for him to go hide. The punishments did get much more severe. They had this hole that they put people in. This item called the box. People were put in there for punishment purposes. A person would be blindfolded, and they would be told eels and leeches were in there. You want to die, do you? I don't give a shit tonight. We put him in the fucking box tonight. How about, the, how about, how about, how about going in the box tonight? Dad. Put your hand in there. Put your, put, your put your hand in there. We might as well be free from you. Nobody else see it. Nobody else see it. You couldn't trust anyone with any information. Children turned in their parents. So if anyone asks you, oh, how do you like Jonestown? I love it. It's great. Hello, family. Greetings from a truly promised land pre prepared by Father. Hello, family. Thank Father I have a chance to talk to you. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> The mail was definitely censored. 
I didn't get all the letters that were sent to me. If you were to write, basically your letter consisted of, so glad I'm here, oh, Jim Jones is a wonderful leader and we're building a utopia. That was what you could write. It became extremely repressive, somewhat like a concentration camp. People say, well, how could they stay? And a big reason is they don't have their passports, they don't have money to get home. A huge reason is that they remain dedicated to the cause. And if they do try to get away, there's the jungle. Jim Jones has them. While the people inside this Ukiah home say they fear for the lives of their friends and family far away in that people's temple in Guyana, that Reverend Jim Jones works in some very unexpected ways, but they say that talking about it is worth it. Well, yeah, they try to give you the impression that, that uh, you know, that everything you hear is not the truth and, and that everything is beautiful down there. And... Somehow, Jim Jones has an ability to to control their, their minds and and as long as those minds are controlled, I, I'm afraid there, there's a potential for, for some danger. The concerned relatives was the label for the unhappy ex-members as well as parents who wanted access to the temple's members in Guyana. This is not a commune, this is not a church, this is just insanity. They were having no luck getting through to their family members. They were turned away. Their letters were sent back with uh, simplistic kind of go-away messages that these folks were very bothered by that treatment. I really feel and anybody can question me, I'll submit myself to tests, I'll talk to psychiatrists, whatever, but I believe I was brainwashed. We met with the press. I said, you know, I was there for six years. I said, I know what Jim is capable of. My son, John, obviously was being turned against me, and that's when I decided to fight for my son. The courts are called into play as Grace Stone sues Jim Jones to get custody of John Victor back. And in fact, an arrest order, if he didn't comply, was being issued. I could not let this child go to her. He told me some of the most horrible things she did that you could ever imagine that she did to him and said to him. Jim Jones and the leadership do not want to let go of John Victor Stone because symbolically he represents the ability of anybody stateside to get any child from Jonestown and bring them back to America. The Guyanese court order precipitated what the settlers later called the six-day siege. Every member and the community must come to the pavilion immediately. Jim said, they're coming for our children, and so we need to stand strong. We were being told that the guy in his army was coming in, and we were going to to fight, because, you know, if you take one of us, you have to take all of us kind of thing. I'm sitting there thinking, I wonder how I'm going to die today. Are they going to come with machine guns, and I'm going to get shot? I wonder what a bullet feels like. At 20. I didn't think I was going to see 21. I got a hell of a lot of weapons to fight. I got my claws, I got compasses, I got guns, I got dynamite, I got a hell of a lot to fight. I'll fight, I'll fight, I'll fight. Jim told us that we were under attack by the Guyanese Army. And we're up all night, like a human chain, with our machetes, there's guns, there's people, the security is out. 
We'd stand there, and then after a while, Jim would say, well, they're not gonna come tonight. And then he sends us to bed. And then the next night can happen again. It was six days of being told that you're under attack and you might die at any moment. We weren't getting any rest. People were exhausted. This is the psyche. This is what this is what he's doing to us. He's constantly preparing us to where we're thinking about our own deaths. Jim Jones started talking about revolutionary suicide and that if they couldn't stay together because of their enemies, then they would die together in order to show loyalty to one another. He was standing on the steps to the radio room and the people that were still there, you know, 400 or so, he actually said, let's take a vote. How many people here want to commit revolutionary suicide? Three people raised their hand. Three. And I saw the look of kind of disappointment on his, in his eyes, but also a strategic look, kind of like, hmm, what am I gonna have to do? I'll never forget that. The whole thing was that we were under attack by the Guyanese government. And then years later, we find out that it was really over the custody battle. So what are you gonna do? So what am I gonna do now? Well, I, you know, I've been fighting this legal case for two years, trying to get John, and I'll just keep on trying and trying. I'm getting John Stone out of there, no matter what I have to do. This was 1978. I was a legislative counsel to a member of Congress in San Francisco. The concerned relatives started writing to members of Congress, Congressman Ryan being one of them. I think the issues in this campaign are pretty much what they are any place else in the country. They're concerned about their jobs, they're concerned about the war in Vietnam. Leo Ryan had a reputation as a man who was willing to investigate when he was warned that there was abuse of prisoners, he got himself anonymously put in prison for a week. When the fate of baby seals was brought to his attention, he went up to defend the seals by throwing his body in front of one of them. The first thing we have to do is to get in touch with Jonestown. Congressman Ryan had this uncanny ability to look beneath. And he listened to these defectors. Many of them were interviewed, and it became very apparent to him that there was something wrong. I'm trying to find out what the facts are as an absolutely non-committed person. I have so he decided that he wanted to do a congressional delegation trip to Guyana and visit the People's Temple there. At night, you hear gunshots. And Jim says, those are the people out there trying to come in and kill us. He's got everybody scared. In preparation for the trip, I remember sitting in my office listening to audio tapes of interviews from defectors and having this ominous feeling. I did have a premonition about the trip. You know, I did try to warn Congressman Ryan I don't think anybody heard us and or they didn't believe us. You say there's a lot of this and you can't believe that. I'm telling you that you have never met up with a man like Jim Jones. Tuesday, November 14th. Congressman Leo Ryan and his party of people related to cult members, reporters and cameramen left the United States for Georgetown, Guyana, hoping to get to Jonestown. When Leo Ryan and the concerned relatives in the media arrive in Georgetown, they have a couple tough days. 
Ryan is trying to get permission to enter Jonestown. Jones says no. Yankees go home. And uh, that's the present somewhat hostile attitude of the uh, people's temple. Congressman Ryan approached our group and said, okay, we have two planes, um, we have this many seats. The concerned relatives groups started kind of fighting over the seats. And I just stepped back and I said, I'm not fighting for a seat on the airplane. I was told later, people said that if I had shown up on that airstrip on the way in, they would have killed everybody right then and there. Nobody would have ever even got into Jonestown. There was so much hatred for me. Friday, November 17th. Congressman Ryan and his party headed for Jonestown, not certain whether they would get there or what they would find. We may have a group of bad relatives who are working with Congressman Ryan to try to dictate to us and take us back as prisoners. And that means every one of you will have to say to your relatives, no, I will not be a prisoner. No, I will not go back. We were told that Leo Ryan was coming because he was part of the CIA. We were drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled. People were rehearsed, and so it was a huge, huge, huge deal. The government didn't hear him come in the CIA conspiracy, but I do know what you mean. The settlers in Jonestown hear from Jones that there are going to be people coming. There are people who start to see this might be the time we leave Guyana. When a congressman comes, surely, you know, nobody's going to screw with a congressman. You could leave with him, you might be safe. And I remember thinking, I didn't know how I was going to leave, but I made that commitment to myself and my son. I said, Jakari will not spend another birthday here. Diane Louie, a very close friend of mine, said her boyfriend, Richard Clark, had started finding a way out the moment he arrived in Jonestown. And I told her that I wanted to go. I wanted to leave with Congressman Ryan. I immediately thought, this is my chance to get out of here. So I was walking down the path, and Monica Bagby just says, let's get the fuck out of here. And so from then on, we tried to talk to one another, to bolster one another. I'm probably the one who needed the bolstering. Yes, I mean, it, it, it sounds crazy, but yes, we have a right to leave. Yes, you know, it's okay that we leave. I wrote the note, you know, help us get out of Jonestown. And um, that was my plan, to hand him the note and asked for his assistance to leave. And it was very much like a prison escape. You're not walking out of here. That was what Jim said. You are not leaving here walking. You'll be dead in a box. You're not leaving here. The consequences of conspiring to leave was death. Period. Congressman Ryan. I'm from the United States government. We're here to inquire into the uh, health and the welfare of American citizens who are here. If you want to see your congressman, stick around. He may come in. I don't know how long he'll stay, but I can assure you that if he stays long enough for tea, he's going to be ready. I heard a plane overhead on November 17th. That was Friday. A twin engine plane, and then the alarm sounded. 
And so I'm excited and I'm scared. First, we went on a tour of the commune, and it was impressive. I mean, you are in the deepest, thickest jungle, and yet they had carved out a viable community. Virtually every person we talked to said the same thing. I love it here. I never want to go home. You're happy like, here. I'm very happy here. It's the best place I've ever been. You want to stay? Definitely. I certainly do. Some people have said they couldn't leave if they wanted to. Do you think you could? Yeah, if, if I really wanted to, I'll, I'm free to go. If I was really, if you really wanted to, I'd be able to free to go. They had entertainment that night. Jim Jones was showing the congressman, this is our people. Everything was riding that night on Congressman Ryan's acceptance of us. So the atmosphere was extremely tense. There's a huge show being put on for the benefit of the community, but obviously for us as well. The entertainment is going on. Ryan was invited to get up and talk to everybody. I'm very glad to be here. This is a congressional inquiry. I think that all of you know that I'm here to find out more about uh, questions that have been raised about your operation here. But I can tell you right now that whatever the comments are, there are some people here who believe that this is the best thing that ever happened to them in their whole life. And the place just exploded in applause not rehearsed, has been um, printed many, many times. It was, it was loud. My brother told me afterwards that it was the loudest they'd ever heard Jonestown. But it was manic. There was an artificiality to it. And it didn't just go on for 30 seconds. It went on for minutes and minutes. <laughs> What I hear is this incredible tension being broken by this way over enthusiastic clapping. It was during the performance that I thought, this is my chance to get out of here. The stakes were very high. It was like an all or nothing, do or die. This is going to work or else reporter Don Harris was kind of doing a circle around the crowd in the inside. So he made it possible for me to pass the note. And I put the note in the kind of the curve of his uh, elbow. But the note fell out on the ground. And this little kid I think it was, was 10 or something. He started yelling, he passed a note, he passed a note. And I picked it up and I said, I think he dropped something. And I handed it back to him and um, he walked on. I'm exposing myself totally and I am in pure terror. Don Harris approaches us and he hands Congressman Ryan a note. And the note had Vern Gosney and Monica Bagby's name on it, and it indicated they wanted to get out of there. So my heart sank. I thought, this is it. It's really true. People are being held here against their will. We hear Vern Gosney has passed a note to somebody saying he wanted to leave. Diane comes and she says, we're leaving tomorrow. That was the plan. After the performance, Congressman Ryan came and spoke with me. And he said, you are the first one to ask to leave. 
you'll have the first seats on the plane. And I told him, you're in extreme danger. You need to leave now. He said, well, we can't. He didn't have any transportation to leave. He couldn't leave if he wanted to. I remember lying on this top bunk and listening to a torrential downpour that night on this roof. It was staccato sound. And I don't know that I got a wink of sleep that night. I was just thinking, how are we gonna get out of here safely? We're just a news team. We don't care one way or the other. You're convinced that Jim Jones is a good man? Definitely. Yes, yes, yes. I should say so. Yes. yes. I mean, I'm 27 years old, black, free, and I make my own choices. And I definitely think Jim Jones is a beautiful, more, he's got more character than I've ever seen out of anyone. And I respect him very, very much. On November 18th, it was determined that we were going to leave. My husband, Joe, and I have separated. I have Jakari. But that day, Joe shows up, and I'm holding our son. He says, where are you going? I said, we're going on a picnic. And he goes, a picnic? And I'm thinking, this is the stupidest excuse you could ever come up with. OK, we blew it. It's over. Then he just said, well, today's not a good day. Don't go. <laughs> That's what he said. Now I'm panicking a little bit. We have to hustle. Richard says it's 30 something miles and we got to walk it. And so we left. And we just started walking down the road. I have Jakari tied to a sheet on my back. And I'm so scared. I am so unbelievably scared. It's hard to breathe. I feel like my heart's in my throat. I'm trying to keep from panic and, and I'm just waiting for the bullet. I met with Congressman Ryan and Jackie Spears. Congressman Ryan said, you have a congressional shield of, uh, of protection around you. Nothing can happen to you. And I just thought, you're insane. So then I went to say goodbye to my son. And Edith, his caretaker, was in the middle between these two guards. And then I saw my son. I remember him sitting with me and just being like a typical four-year-old who can't sit still and just squirming and calling all around. And then he went back to Edith. It's a moment that I've went over a million times in my mind a million times in my mind. But I didn't know what was going to happen. So and this is when Jones finally showed up at the pavilion. And I was standing off to the side when he was being interviewed by Don Harris of NBC. Harris showed him the note from Vern or Monica saying they wanted to leave. Last night, someone came and passed me this note. Well, that's who we're talking about. He wants to leave his son here. If Jones sounds such a bad place, why does he want to leave his son here? Doesn't it concern you, though, that, that this man, for whatever reason, one of the people in your group... People was... play games, friend. They lie. But if it's so damn bad, why is he leaving his son here? Can you give me a good reason for that? I'll ask I'd take my son, I'd take my son with me. But you could see that he was not right. I mean, uh, I couldn't see how not right he was, but you could see he was not right.
The mood in that pavilion was starting to be chaos. And I realized at that moment that there was other people that wanted to leave. My name is Jackie Spear. And what is your wish today? To go back, go back home. And where is home? U.S. I was quite shocked because those two families came with Jim Jones from Indiana. It's not that I don't think what you're doing here is wonderful because I do. Just, just, just know that we there's always a place for you. Always a place. Sorry. I said there's always a place yeah, for you. Yeah, I know, I know, I know there always will be a place for you. But I'm forgetting the person. People that had been with Jim for decades came up and said, we want to go. And all of a sudden, the whole mood changed. I remember there was this screaming match going on. You bring those kids back here! Hold on a second. You, you bring them back! One second. A couple with a child was pulling on the child. One parent had one arm pulling. She wanted to go, and the other one wanted to stay. Don't you And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is, the intensity of emotion had just skyrocketed. I had tears rolling down my face. It was just, it was so incredibly emotional. But Jones's demeanor changed. I could see the anger growing on his face. In terms of people leaving, it had gone from seven or eight to now 13 or 14 and now another nine, we're up over 20 people. It was decided as the group of people who wanted to leave grew that Congressman Ryan would stay behind and we would have two airlifts. And I would take the first group out. And all of a sudden, Larry Layton jumps onto the truck. Dale Parks came and said, Larry Layton is coming with us. You've got to watch him. He's a plant. He's not, he, he's not a sincere person who wants to leave. We've got to watch him. And so we all went, got on the truck. We're getting ready to leave. And I remember talking to Don Harrison we were feeling relieved, like we were getting out of this powder keg. All of a sudden, the wind, I mean, literally out of nowhere, the wind picked up to like 35, 40 miles an hour. The sky turned black, and just this torrential downpour happened. What I felt, and I felt it physically, was evil blow into Jonestown. It's like a supernatural force swept in and took over the place. The reason this was so important is because the truck couldn't leave. They kept running the motor and running the motor and couldn't get out of the mud. But what was going through my mind is, you're not getting out of here. You're not gonna leave. And then there was this eruption from the pavilion. Congressman Ryan is back in the pavilion. He's across from me, he's talking to me. And I noticed a man named Don Sly walking up behind Congressman Ryan. He's shaking like a leaf. And it looks like he's actually crying. And I thought to myself, somebody else is leaving, you know? Oh, well, he's leaving too. And all of a sudden, a knife comes out. And he says, all right, motherfucker, you're gonna die. We all jumped on him and we got the knife away. Congressman Ryan is sitting down and you can see blood on the congressman's shirt. He was obviously shaken up. Somebody just tried to kill him. Personally, what I felt was, oh my God, the leader is a murderer. I've been playing peace and love and he's a fucking murderer. 
I felt completely naive. By this time, Jones is sitting there, and he's like this, and he starts. I've never felt Jonestown so peaceful. And I got chills all over my body because Jones had never been more in pain or more agony. It felt literally to me like Jonestown was disintegrating in front of my eyes. Out walks Congressman Ryan, and he's got blood stains on his shirt. He gets into the cab of the truck, and the truck takes off with the airstrip. I thought, oh my gosh, we are so lucky. I mean, we've just dodged a bullet. There's an attempt on Ryan's life. We've got these defectors. I'm still unsure about why Larry Layton's on this truck, but we'll sort it out when we get to the airstrip. For myself, the feeling in that truck was terror, foreboding. I don't think there was a lot of talking going on. It's six miles to Port Kaituma. The roads are narrow, the roads are muddy. It's going to take a little while to get there. They're gone maybe 10 minutes when a tractor pulls out of Jonestown after them, and there's a number of men on it, six, seven, eight, all armed, and they disappear too. At this point in time in the pavilion, I'm kind of afraid because I helped save the congressman's life. So I started kind of easing my way out of the pavilion. I walked back to the cottages and I felt literally like there was a target on my back. It felt like I had a sniper's scope on my back. <sighs> this was so hard. I get back to the cottages and Gloria's there with Malcolm. And she's laying down on the bed and Malcolm was playing on the floor with his toys. And I said, do you know what's happening up there? And she shook her head, yes. And we just started holding each other. And I said, I'm afraid we're all gonna die. At Port Kaituma, Ryan, because there's so many people coming, has called ahead asking that an extra plane come, that there would be two planes instead of one. They're still sorting that out. When Leo Ryan is going to go ahead and give an interview to the TV crew on the tarmac. Did he say anything when he came up? Yeah, he said uh, something about uh, rob and choke and kill and, uh, or knife, I don't, I don't know. But the obvious, what he said was he intended to kill me. Congressman Ryan is talking to some members of the press. I start to board passengers onto planes. And I'm boarding the smaller plane first. Myself and Larry Layton were assigned to the small plane. Congressman Ryan at this point has come over and I says, you know, I don't trust Larry Layton. I don't want to be on the same plane. One of the press people is there and I says, would you just frisk him? He frisks him, doesn't find the guy. All of a sudden, in comes the tractor from Jonestown. They're starting to think, uh-oh, there's trouble. All of a sudden, there's this noise. I looked out the window and said, they're killing everybody. They're killing everybody. It does not even register to me that it's guns going off. I see Ryan running. All of a sudden, I'm hit. I looked out the window. I said, they're killing everyone. They're killing everyone. And I turned to Larry, and he shot me twice. Point blank, one on each side, once in the leg. 
And then Larry shot Monica twice in the back. I think he had one bullet left and he took it and pointed it right in Dale Park's face and pulled the trigger and the gun misfired. And so we had the fight for the gun. I'm lying under the plane, pretending I'm dead. And I look down at the right side of my body and my whole right leg is just blown up. And I realize that I'm dying. The adrenaline was running. I felt no pain. I was in survival mode and I overpowered Larry Layton. I went out through the pilot's door. I could still hear the gunshots and I ran to the side of the runway until I collapsed and I just started calling for help. There are other people grievously wounded. Some younger people who were part of the group run into the jungle. Other people are slightly wounded, trying to hide in the grass. The gunmen make certain that Leo Ryan is dead. They could have continued hunting for the wounded, finish them off, but instead they get on the tractor and return to Jonestown. Eventually, Guyanese locals get to the airstrip and place me on the side of the airstrip. Unfortunately, I'm placed on top of an anthill. So all of a sudden I have these ants crawling over my body. And I oftentimes say, you know, you don't sweat the small stuff when you're dying. I don't recall how big the group of assassins were. I don't know, four, five, six. They were all people I knew for many years. All the assassins, including Larry as well. I knew everyone. There are five dead on the tarmac. The five dead include Ryan, members of the media, and one woman who had been at Jonestown and was trying to escape. Meanwhile, back at Jonestown, a voice comes on the speaker saying everyone needs to come to the pavilion. Jim Jones realized it's no longer a matter of if, but when. He's not gonna be able to go back to the States what was going to be left to him was to tell his followers that now is the time we're committing a revolutionary act. The congressman's dad, they've killed people. So my dad at this point, he knows he's gone. So he knows he's going out and now he, he doesn't want to go alone. As people were walking up from the cottages, it was very quiet, it was very somber. I see Jones in his conversation, and it's very animated, and it's obvious that something is going on. He's saying that there are people coming right now to attack us. They're going to take us out. This is our final stand. Maria Katsaris comes up, whispers something in Jones's ear. Maria Katsaris was one of Jones's true, quote unquote, lieutenants. One of the people that was closest to Jim Jones. Jim looks at her and he goes, is it supposed to be quick? She goes, yes, it's supposed to be quick. And he said, does it taste okay? She goes, yes, it's supposed to taste good. Somewhere in Jonestown, human guinea pigs were testing cyanide that was mixed in a vat of Flavor-Aid. Flavor-Aid was a cheap Kool-Aid knockoff. And I'm thinking, oh my God, how do I get out of here? How do I get Gloria and Malcolm out of here with me? as people are gathering in the pavilion. Jones took the stage. And we don't have to wonder what was said that day. There was a tape running. It's known now as the death tape. How very much I've loved you. How very much I've tried my best to give you the good life. But in spite of all of that I've tried, a handful of our people, with their lives, 
have made our life impossible. There's no way to detach ourselves from what's happened today. And we, we are sitting here waiting on a powder keg. It was said by the greatest of prophets from time immemorial. No man takes my life from me, I lay my life down. If we can't live in peace, then let's die in peace. November 18th, my brothers went to go see a movie. I stayed at the compound. Early evening, I was called to the radio room by Sharon Amos. I never liked Sharon. She was a fanatic. My father was in the radio. And he said, Jimmy, we're visiting Mr. Frazier, which was a code. Then he said, the Avenging Angels have visited Leo Ryan, and we need you to avenge our actions. In code, break that up was, we're going to commit to revolutionary suicide. The congressman has been killed. We need you to avenge our deaths, so kill anybody in town and kill yourself. I know when I was in Jonestown and they were having these white night drills and long meetings about dying for the cause, I never took it serious. I never thought we were going to die for the cause. I, I broke out of code. Dad, we're not going to kill ourselves. People in Jonestown can't die. But no, 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 Jim. Meanwhile, I'm like, go get my brothers. So they went and got them and Sharon Amos is like, oh, we got to figure out how to kill ourselves. Do we have piano wire? Do we have, um, you know, thin wire? I mean, she's kind of tweaking out. We quickly made our way back to the headquarters in Georgetown. I knew that things were far worse than they'd ever been before, and I'm trying to manage the situation. I had told someone, do not let Sharon Amos out of your sight. I knew she had to be watched and that she was volatile and capable of terrible things. We ran over to the U.S. Embassy, and we're talking to a little squawk box, and they won't let us in. We're saying, send us into Jonestown. We can stop it. We don't know what's going on, but you need to send us out there right now. They're saying, surely the embassy, if nothing else, can get a helicopter. If we can get back to Jonestown before anything happens, we can stop it. And they're trying to call in, you know, this emergency. It's, no, we're closed. You know, it's Saturday. So we go back to the house. Everyone's screaming and yelling. Sharon Amos had taken her kids into the bathroom with a guy named Chuck Beitman. And took our niece inside, Stephanie, and cut the children's throats. What I came upon is not something that I, I want to describe, but it was horrible. You can still hear people gurgling. Our friend Calvin Douglas busted in the bathroom and pulled Stephanie out. She still has a scar. We called the police. And the police came. By then, the gurgling has stopped. Back in Jonestown, Jim Jones is on the stage I don't know who fired the shot. I don't know who killed the congressman. But as far as I'm concerned, I killed him. You understand what I'm saying? I killed him. He had no business coming. I told him not to come. And as soon as the word gets out, the army's going to be parachuting in. They're going to come for us. They're going to kill us all. They're going to get our kids. We can't let that happen. We need to commit revolutionary suicide. We can't go back. They won't leave us alone. They're now going back to tell more lies, which means more congressmen. And there's no way, no way we can survive. Mm -hmm. 
As they are in the pavilion getting ready to commit suicide, a woman by the name of Christine Miller begins to question what the logic is behind letting 14 people who defect cause the deaths of over a thousand people. Yes, Ms. Christine. I said I'm afraid to die. I don't think I you are. Means. I don't think you are. But I look at our babies and I think they deserve I, to live. I agree. You know? But also they deserve peace. I'm completely schizophrenic at this time because one part of me is saying everybody's going to die, you're going to die, and another part of me is saying this doesn't make any sense. You don't kill everybody. Everybody dies. I haven't seen anybody yet didn't die. And I like to choose my own kind of death for a change. I'm tired of being tormented to hell. That's what I'm tired of. By this time, the pavilion is filled up with people. There's armed guards around the pavilion, but the energy there was just, um, I don't even know how to describe it, defeated. It was kind of like people had been crushed. At this point, I'm kind of intellectual. It's like, well, how is this going to come down? How am I going to die? What's going to happen? Because I'm not going to go down without a fight. When there's a tap on my shoulder. He's been tapped on the shoulder by Maria Ketzer. So is his brother, Mike. Jim has a job for you. Come with us. And they're taken to a back cabin. And there are three suitcases. She goes, we have suitcases of money that need to be delivered to the Russian embassy in Georgetown. Will you take them? She gave us each a, a gun. She said, if you're successful, take what you need to live on and have a good life. But under no circumstances are you to be taken alive. You're to kill yourselves if you're caught. As to why I wanted to go to the Russians, I don't know if it was Jim Jones' final F you to the United States government. I don't know. But I said yes. And in my mind, I was buying time. because so I couldn't catch up. I could not catch up with what was going on. Who wants to go with their child has a right to go with their child. I think it's humane. Well, I want to see you go, though. I don't want to see you go through this hell no more. No more, no more, no more. As the vats of cyanide-laced flavor aid are brought out, they are instructed to give the drink to the children first. Because, of course, once the children have been poisoned, how can any adult live after having watched their own children die? Hurry, my children, hurry. All right, they just not fall into the hands of the enemy. Hurry, my children. They have syringes, and they're going to squirt this stuff in the baby's mouths. No more pain now. No more pain. No more pain. If you adults would stop some of this nonsense, adults, 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 I call on you to stop this nonsense. I call on you to quit exciting your children when all they're doing is going to quiet rest. I call on you to stop this now if you have any respect at all. Meanwhile, the adults are about to have their turn. Where is the vat, the vat, the vat, where is the vat with the green seas? Right here so the adults can begin. People are lining up, and some of them refuse to do it, and they're held down and forcibly injected. And we know this because later with the bodies, some of them had abscesses on their neck, on their arms, on their skull, anywhere a needle could get jammed. That's where the needles went in. And everybody else is lined up to die. So while Maria's getting the gold, I went to get water. You don't go into the jungle without water. As I'm approaching the back of the pavilion, it's when people started dying. And I, and I cannot go through the rest of it today. I just can't. Um, but needless to say, my wife and son were dying. It was just darkness. There was no light anywhere in my life. As I'm walking back to Jones's cottage, 
Carolyn Layton was coming up, and she said, what's wrong, Tim? Why are you crying? All I could say is, they've murdered my son, they've murdered my son, they've murdered my son. Joan says it's going to be easy. But death by cyanide is one of the worst ways to go possible. It keeps your body from absorbing oxygen. You suffocate slowly. I tell you, I don't care how many screams you hear, I don't care how many anguish cries, death is a million times preferable to 10 more days of this life. The sounds I was hearing were screaming. People were screaming in fear, in pain, in death. There was nothing joyous going on. There was no grand hallelujah for Jim Jones. Marceline Jones was screaming, stop this, stop this, stop this. People were being massacred. Mother, please, 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 don't, don't do this, don't do this. People have painted this picture that my mother was up there doling out the poison, but that runs contrary to what I know about my mother. She came from a standby and slightly behind your man era, but she was also very strong-willed. My father ordered her restrained, and she struggled until the last child died. At that point in time, I just wanted the nightmare to stop. I wanted to die. And there was a voice in my head that said, you cannot die, you cannot die, you must go on, you cannot die. We went back to the cottages, got the suitcases, and left Jonestown. At this point in time, I don't even know if I wanted to live, but I knew I wanted nothing to do with Jim Jones, I wanted nothing to do with Russians, I wanted nothing to do with money. So I said, we can't do this. We need to dump the suitcases. And there's a part of me that doesn't even believe that I just saw what I saw. 1,000 people say we don't like the way the world is. Take our life from us. We laid it down. We got tired. We didn't commit suicide, we committed an act of revolutionary suicide protesting the conditions of an inhumane world. There's been a monsoon the day before. Steam is rising up off the ground. It's like fog. And finally, the fog, the mist is clearing a little bit. And what they see, they find almost impossible to describe over the radio to the superiors waiting back in Georgetown. They start describing there's just heaps of them. And of course in Georgetown, heaps of what? Dead people. As soon as these pictures from Jonestown cleared our newsroom, everybody, even a lot of hardened news people, reacted in horror and disbelief. The word on everybody's lips was shades of Auschwitz. As you can see, bodies are strewn all over the place. The bodies seemed awful and orderly. Not flung about like corpses after a battle, but neat. Hand in hand sometimes, arms about each other's shoulders. The death ritual was methodical. Some of the syringes contained poison. The rest had tranquilizers. 
Marcia, you have more. Yeah, of course, there's a lot we don't know, but uh, this we do know. The Reverend Jim Jones, who the founder of People's Temple, is dead, and he died as a result of a gunshot wound to the head, not of poisoning. Jim Jones, they find, on the pavilion. Bloated, dead, gunshot wound to the head. You can suspect that Jim Jones, having seen the terrible deaths his followers were suffering, at the last minute didn't want it for himself. Police believe that most of the people went willingly, but others were forced by armed guards. When the poison was being passed out, men were around this auditorium area here with crossbows. They were acting as guards. Clayton, 28 of Oakland, is one of four known eyewitnesses to the suicide murders. He got away after more than 700 had died by slipping past a guard. A lot of people didn't want to die. They were just sitting there, frightened, um, afraid. And in one case, um, she struggled pretty hard because she didn't want to die. Um, and how did they kill her? They injected her in the arm. The soldiers, they're asked, can you count them? And they try. 400 suicides and killings. One of the most astonishing stories of our time, perhaps of any time. Well, there's at least 900-something people in Jonestown. That must mean there's 500 people who are still alive. Maybe they've run into the jungle. The morning that we left, my plan was to escape, come back and get my sister and brother and my niece and nephew. So once we realized that the tragedy happened, I'm just praying that one of my family members ran to the jungle, if not all of them. But the body count was wrong from the beginning. Good evening. The searching American soldiers have finished counting the bodies in Jonestown, Guyana. 910 died in the poison ritual of the People's Temple last week. Why in the world would so many people agree to kill themselves? What kind of a leader could order mass suicide and be obeyed? The mass suicides happened in this heavily forested area, down there in the compound. The narrative is mass suicide, sheep, drinking the Kool-Aid, voluntarily drinking the Kool-Aid. And yet, a lot of people were murdered. And if you just, seeing your child murdered, besides wanting to kill the motherfucker that did it, would you want to live? The answer is probably no. If you believe that the only choice you have is dying by drinking a poison or getting shot, are you committing suicide? Or are you taking the easiest way out because you know that you're going to die anyway? The bottom line is what happened in Jonestown, Guyana, was murder. I lost my entire immediate family in Jonestown. I lost my mother, Inez, who was 50. I lost my brother, Mark, who was 16. I lost my sister, Michelle, who was 24. I lost Joe, who was 24. Yeah, I lost them all at, in one moment. They didn't want me to keep my hopes up for, for John Victor. But finally, one of the survivors said that they had personally seen John and that he had evidently been taken. He was in Jim's cabin, and then he had been injected, and they actually saw. So I knew for sure that he was deceased, so. I was shot once on each side, 
my diaphragm, my stomach, my liver, my pancreas was removed. When I came out of ICU, I found out what had happened in Jonestown, because I did not know. The psychiatrist just came into my room and opened the paper like this to show me the pictures of the dead bodies. I think at the moment when I knew that my son was dead and being asked to describe his clothing, I think my mind just snapped. I just think I just had a, a mental breakdown. I, uh, I, I didn't function really well for a very long time. How are you going to handle this nightmare? I don't know. I don't know. It's a nightmare. For the survivors, things were only going to get worse. The cultists try to forget, but all know they can never escape the stigma of what happened at Jonestown. My name's Tim Carter, but I really don't want to talk right now. Tim, please, this is very important. I lost two friends here, too. I lost my wife and my son. I don't want to talk right now. We get to the airport, and all of a sudden, there's just reporters everywhere. So that was the beginning of 36 hours straight of media interviews. But you claim you had no role in the actual deaths of other people? No, no because we didn't see it. We got to go. But the very first reporter said, this is going on the evening national news, saying that you guys are hitmen. You can respond if you want or not. You were an elite. You had a better life inside Jonestown, and that you could have saved people. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. There was no place for us to go or hide. Stay with him. Hey, hey, this is, this is all private, okay, you guys? Stay back. After everyone died, the media was everywhere. It wasn't mass suicide, you know, it was, it was mass murder. I wanted to stop it. All those people in my life, all my 19 years, I've known no one else, right? Uh, what am I gonna do? Uh, you see what's happened when a few people tried to leave. I didn't know what could happen. I'm doing the best I can. There were many people within the community that I loved. We had just lost everything, we were devastated. I know I felt complicit, I felt terrified, horrified, grief-stricken, hopeless, and ashamed. I can almost say that I hate this man for doing what he's done because he has destroyed everything I've lived for. Moments after the latest 17 survivors arrived at Kennedy Airport last night, FBI agents escorted them onto buses for the most intense questioning yet of returning survivors. Included in the group, the Reverend Jim Jones' adopted son, Jim. Um, he, to, to me, he was sick. I'm not no medical person, but if I, was, if I was to look at him, I would look at him and say, that's a sick man. We arrived penniless and hungry and, you know, traumatized by our whole experience. And then they kept up the questioning. They were suspected of being part of the plot. People all think they're nuts. They might be murderers. They're all scarred in that way. We were followed. I would go to work, I'd have a plain coast car following me. I think some of that was like, what the hell's going on with them? What are they going to do? After I escaped Jonestown, I was still in Jonestown in my mind. There was a lot of paranoia. I saw a man from the back with black hair. I thought it was Jim Jones, and I would start running. One of the hardest things to deal with among many were Kool-Aid jokes, Jonestown jokes, I was treated by people that thought I was very stupid. We all felt like we had been made fools of, in a way, because we had believed so totally in what Jim Jones was saying. Jim Jones was a cult leader who was maniacal and who was allowed to pursue this horrific um, cause for his personal aggrandizement. 
he had used the word church in sanitizing his grotesque behavior. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Jim went into the deep, dark recesses of his mind, and what came back out was scary. It was terrible. Jones put himself in a position where no one could tell him no. He was enabled. This is what demagogues do. And so gradually, the worst part of his nature took over until finally it consumed him. And sadly, it consumed all the people who believed in him. I felt it was my responsibility to attend as many funerals as possible, especially for my friends, friends of mine. One of my friends, I went to a funeral, and I remember the mother coming out of the hallway with a 38 caliber pistol and pointing it at me and saying, why are you alive when my daughter's not? And then everyone grabbing her, and me kind of sitting there going, pull the trigger. You know, it was, at that, at that point, I didn't want to live. Little has changed in the settlement itself. There are police guards patrolling to keep visitors away. The chair in which Jim Jones sat when he called on his people to die is still there, along with the benches where they sat and listened and obeyed. and defectors who returned from Guyana have settled in San Francisco. The People's Temple building was sold. It is now a Korean Presbyterian church. Doctors say that almost all the former temple members live with anxiety, fear, and guilt. I think that they will be able to, to build a life for themselves. Uh, the, the fears, the memories, and some of the scars uh, for many of them, will, it'll be a lifelong process trying to deal with that. For many years, I wasn't healing. I was battling demons on a daily basis, using everything I could to quiet the noise inside me. And around that time, my daughter was born. That little baby cracked my heart open in a way that pushed me toward life instead of choosing the easy way out. I went by James for a long time. And it wasn't until many years after that I even went by Jim Jones again. After 40 years, I've lived two lifetimes outside People's Temple. I'm grateful that um, I survived. I was hospitalized for two months. I had a lot of time to think. I was so badly wounded that they thought they were gonna to have to amputate my arm and or my leg. I had gas gangrene through my body. I just made a commitment to myself that I did not want to spend the rest of my life as a victim or survivor of Guyana. And I made a commitment then to spend the rest of my life in public service, to continue Congressman Ryan's legacy. When I came back to the United States, I was shattered. I came back with survivor's guilt and I wasn't diagnosed. I was like, why did I survive? Why was I allowed to survive? Inside, I was so broken. I didn't start healing until 20 years later. 
My son, Jakari, calls me his, you know, warrior queen. He understands um, the sacrifice that I made. He knows every step of the way I'm there. I'm just not going anywhere. And I know a lot of it is because of Jonestown. I call Leslie Wagner my, um, my hero because she left with her son. I see her as a person of great courage that she was able to do that. She was able to get her son out and she was able to risk death. I've come to peace with my journey except around my son. That will be something that's always with me I still struggle to forgive myself. The former temple members try to comfort each other. Their temple past is their bond. Whatever their thoughts about Jim Jones, they are all trying to rebuild shattered lives. All of us, if we allow ourselves to step into that story, there's something there we can use. And I pray that anyone watching this can take away from it whatever is valuable to them as a way of honoring those we lost. There are many lessons to be learned from Jonestown. I look at the world today. I look at the environment that we're in. And I see this, this parallel. And I look at how People's Temple began. It began in a time where there was a social, political change, but it was also based on fear. We are in the same type of environment, if not worse, that could generate something much, much more dangerous than Jonestown. It could happen again. I put the blame of what happened in Jonestown on my father. But I don't think the story is Jim Jones. I think the story is the people who followed Jim Jones to, to Jonestown. You know, I always said, I go, how appropriately named was People's Temple? Because it was really the people that made that church. Some of the best years of my life were, were in People's Temple. It wasn't people simple. It was a sense of community, sense of belonging, sense of doing the right thing when no one was looking. It's just really too bad that we couldn't have gone down in history as this great, wonderful humanitarian group that we were. We could have been a force to be reckoned with. I wish that there was an easy answer around People's Temple and Jonestown, but there are no easy answers. And anybody that has taken the time to get to know the story has, has discovered that, oh my gosh, these were like real folks, you know? And nothing special about us, nothing unspecial about us. Maybe even like me. And I might have actually joined something like that.